If you're looking for clear pro-life thinking, cutting-edge apologetics, and a fresh approach to abortion dialogue, you've come to the right place. This is the Equipped for Life podcast. Okay. We're back. We're back. It's <laughs> weird to say we're back and do episode one, but we, it, does, it feels to us like we're back. So if you haven't listened to the episode zero kind of introduction explanation of what's going on, Go listen to that because I'm not going to re-explain all of that now. I was going to say this is an episode that we had recorded um, for the Equip for Life course back in the day, and we had this major technical malfunction. It was the saddest thing in the world when we realized, and now we just kind of want to we, we want to explain the topic, mm -hmm. but we want to explain it where it doesn't sound obnoxious. So yeah. we're going to talk about this. It's one of the most common questions that we get. Um, it, it's not the most common question I get if I, I go and do a speech for a mixed or like a pro-choice audience. Mm -hmm. Like those like those questions are, you know, what about rape? What about life of the mother? What about birth control? Things like that. But if I do a training event for pro-life people. Right, where we're teaching the apologetics. Correct. Yeah. Then this becomes mm -hmm. a really common question is what do you do when people like if you set up, you know, like a trot on a toddler kind of a thing or like, you know, it seems like if it's if it's OK to kill, you know, embryos or fetuses in this situation, then it would also be OK to kill human newborns, too. And then what if they're like, yeah, maybe that's OK. What do you do with that? It's a super common question we get. And we want to spend some time giving some tips for, for how to deal with that. Yeah, so like when we, when we talk about biting the bullet, pretty much that is any situation where pro-choice person is having to admit that they would allow some horrible thing right. like killing babies after they're born, something that's like very obvious to most people that's horrible or take some sort of extremist position of one kind or another. It could be saying that squirrels are persons that are valuable like you and I. Right. Like that most, that one happens a lot. We're talking it, about it that today. A lot. I mean, we have we kind of have a term <laughs> we use for people like that. We'll get to that in a second. We're going to go through I think four different types of uh, yeah. uh, situations where people might bite the bullet. Right. I think we get this question a lot because the way we have created our apologetics training, mm -hmm. oftentimes the pro-life person is making an argument in a way where if the pro-choice person, that we're, we're forcing them to be consistent. Right. If the pro-choice person, it wants to remain pro-choice, mm -hmm. and they're going to be consistent in their worldview, or they're going to be consistent about whatever argument they're making, they're going to have to also bite a really oftentimes uncomfortable, explosive bullet. Right. So that's oftentimes our objective, because when people have to do that, now they're either, do I abandon my argument? Or do I bite this bullet? Right. And we want them to abandon the argument. If right. they bite the bullet, what do you do? And right. that's what we're going to cover today. Right. Um, and I think that this is something which a lot of pro-life people, if they're using our arguments the right way, they're going to come across. Right. Um, so let's go through like maybe an example, and then what do we what do we do? What, what's our step by step process of yeah. handling that situation? Yeah. So like a common case where we see people bite bullets is we're in when we're talking about bodily rights arguments. Um, and so, remember, this is not like a person argument. This is like, look, even if the unborn are persons, even if you pro-lifers are right about that. My body, woman, my choice. My body, my choice. Mm -hmm. I can, yes, she should be able to do whatever she wants with anything inside of her body. Or at least that's a version of a bodily rights argument that we call the sovereign zone argument. Or really, my friend Trent Horn calls the sovereign zone argument, and we continue using that term because I think it's really helpful. It's helpful, yeah. It's a good category. So we talk about this in the Equip for Life course. You should get the Equip for Life course if you don't have it yet. We have a really, really good module on bodily rights arguments. But um, in, in this category, this is a very extreme argument. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing, a lot, like our first step here is going to be to point out the inherent extremism in this argument if it is true if they're right that a woman should be able to do anything she wants with anything inside of her body then there should be no restrictions on abortion mm -hmm. because like and which is not where most pro-choice people are at most pro-choice people are like would be for a late-term abortion ban like poll after poll after poll shows right. that but you can't justify a late-term abortion ban if the like the way that you're grounding your pro-choice view is she can do whatever she wants because where's the baby in the third trimester is <laughs> still yeah. in her body right mm -hmm. and so what we want to do is kind of show them here is the natural kind of result of that view if you're right um, and then see if they respond and some people 
abandon the entire bodily rights argument altogether and jump to a person thing, which is great, and we can talk mm-hmm. about that. And then some people, and we've had cases where people just kind of bite the bullet and say, yeah, I guess I guess you're right. I guess you should be able to, like, there should be no restrictions on abortion at all. And then, and then you've got to deal with that kind of a situation. Yeah, and I think it really depends on how you're setting up the argument. There's a way mm. to do this that's very gracious and a way yes. to do it that's very annoying. Yes. You know, we don't want to do the... So what you're saying is you think that, you know, <laughs> the Kathy Newman, I call this the, the Kathy, Kathy Newman. Newman. Mm-hmm. If you haven't watched the Kathy Newman, Jordan Peterson uh, Channel 4 interview, you have to watch it because I've watched it four times. <laughs> it is so entertaining. And it's yeah. what she does the entire time. It's like, so what you're saying is, and it's like this, uh, like really obnoxious caricature. Mm-hmm. And then and it's just fun to watch him because in, in his case, he didn't <laughs> sweat and get all like flustered. It was just like. That's no, not what I'm saying so, at all. <laughs> he gets to the point where he's actually laughing at it because it's like it's so funny that he kept on using this phrase over mm-hmm. and over and over. I call that the Kathy Newman. Yeah, we don't, don't want to be do we that. don't want to be doing that. But there is a way to do it where you're talking about in like the world of philosophy, mm-hmm. the virtue is consistency. Yes. You want to be consistent with your argument and your worldview. Right. And so I could say something like, you know, we've been talking for a while and I feel like I'm understanding where you're coming from. Mm-hmm. It feels like you are justifying abortion because of a woman's right to her own bodily autonomy. Right. And it sounds like you're saying that the reason she can have an abortion is because we, the government shouldn't be putting any restrictions and she shouldn't tell her what she can and cannot do with her body at all. Right. If your argument's true, then to be consistent, we would also have to say you can't place restrictions on abortion in the third trimester because that would be placing a restriction on her body. Right. So can I ask how you feel about like late term abortion? Right. Are you, you know, are you one of those people that you think there should be no restrictions on abortion for any reason? Right. Or is that just way, way too late? Right. Um, and if, if you want to have a, a late term exception, then how do you reconcile that with your view? Right. We need to be consistent here. Right. And, and now I'm like putting them in that ultimatum place. Yeah. But I want to give them an out. Right. So I could give them an out and say, it seems like. We're going to have to find another argument to justify abortion. Right. You know? And we can even help them do (laughs) that. Like, I'm (laughs) totally happy to help them, like, work out their, like, a Mm -hmm. better pro choice argument and then defeat that one, too. And and we do that sometimes. And then sometimes we kind of let them kind of take the lead and see if they can kind of work their way out of the hole Mm -hmm. that they've sort of dug. But what we want to talk about is what do we do when they dig their heels in? And they're like, nope, I'm I'm going with the with, yeah. the, with the extreme view. What do yeah. we do there? So we wanted to offer some practical tips yes, for that. Th- definitely. Three specifically, I think mm-hmm. we have outlined out. So 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 the first tip is this: try to give them an out, mm-hmm. which is going to be something like, do you really believe that, or are you saying that in this conversation because you don't want to abandon this argument? Would be kind of one 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 way of saying that. Yeah, and I think that that's a really um, good thing to do because. Sometimes people just they want to they want to like stay where they started and mm-hmm. they don't want to go anywhere else because they don't want to concede like any ground. Yeah, because yeah, it feels like defeat. Yeah. So if the person's saying, well, mm, I guess that we should just not restrict abortion at all. Right. I guess I guess we should have nine month abortions. You know, the, I'm OK with changing the law to be that. Do you really do you really think we should do that? Right. Like, I just want to ask, have you have you thought this through a little bit? Because. Obviously, late-term abortions are more rare than early, but do you want to live in a country that has abortions in the ninth month of pregnancy right. in this state? Like, are you okay with that happening because you want to defend first-trimester abortions, or should we find an argument which would allow that? Right. So, so to be clear, yeah. like, we're, we're mm-hmm. giving them an out because sometimes they do not mean what they just said. Yes. They're feeling cornered, basically. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of like, you know, when, when, when you corner, like, uh, you know, certain kinds of animals, like, they freak out. Mm-hmm. Um, they they won't concede. They go into fight mode because mm-hmm. they're you know like f- flight mode is out now, right? And so <laughs> yeah. there's like and so there's a thing here where they're feeling cornered, and they're in kind of fight mode. So like I, I've been thinking about a new way of doing this. I haven't had a chance to test this yet. I don't think, but I've been thinking about like a kind of an alternative version that, that I might that I definitely want to try sometimes. Where and it might be funny and it's it's a little bit more uh, meta, but it might work. It might end up failing too. To be mm-hmm. fair, I have not tested this, but the, like the, the idea, of, like just just like compl- I want them to feel like they can rewind the tape mm-hmm. and not lose anything. So 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 uh, w- the thing that I want to try is saying something like this. So here's the thing that happens sometimes when when I talk to people <laughs> mm-hmm. about abortion is sometimes I'm talking to people and they feel like this is like a debate. 
Mm-hmm. Like they're in kind of like fight mode where there's like winners and losers. And that's not the way that I'm thinking about this. I'm not thinking about this like a fight because I, I, I don't think there's any winners or losers. I think winning for me is we find more truth together, mm-hmm. whether that's me changing some of my beliefs or you changing some of your beliefs or both. Um, like that's winning for me. I, like, there's no audience here. No one's yeah. winning today. Um, I'm just trying to find truth. But sometimes, and I don't know if this is what's going on for you or not, but I was mm-hmm. saying sometimes I'm talking to people and they feel like they're in fight mode. And if they concede any ground, like they're they're losing like a, a, a tactical point or something like that. And then they end up saying things that are really extreme because that's their only other choice. They mm-hmm. can either concede a point or they kind of just like dig their heels in. And I don't know if this was going on for you, but if it is, I just want you to know, I would way rather talk to like the real authentic you and like, and, mm-hmm. and, and like, like wrestle with your actual ideas yeah. and not some fake version. Uh, like I, I don't want to wrestle with things like you don't actually believe. Like you're trying to steel man your actual view yes. so that it's maybe more persuasive or it like wins the day or something like that. Right. It's so I, okay. wanna, yeah. I want to tell them like, look, if you want to do over, if that's what's going mm-hmm. on, let's just rewind the tape. You don't lose any points. In fact, I'm actually really impressed. If, <laughs> if you actually say, yeah, I didn't really mean that. Let, let's just rewind. So I'm just going to rewind it. And it's like, it never happened. It's totally cool. And let's just move forward because I want, I want to talk to you. I want to understand what you actually think, um, regardless of what that is. Um, and I'm not sure if you actually believe that nine month abortions are totally okay. So like, help me out. What's, what's, what's going on for you? And because we have to remember when we're in this dialogue as the pro-life advocate, what's our goal Mm -hmm. is our goal to help them change their mind to become pro-life. And if we don't have that goal, maybe it's because we don't even think that's possible. I'm here to tell you it is possible. It does happen, but it only happens when we give them outs when we let them save face. Yep. One thing I have done, I did this in a, uh, an outreach earlier this year. Hmm. I was at the uh, you know, pro-life student table. We had should abortion remain legal set up. And I was talking with a student and I think I said something like, you can make mistakes in this conversation because I know I'm gonna make mistakes. And mm. when I make mistakes, I want you to let me like rewind the tape and go back. I love that. And like not get mad at me and not like leave the conversation. Would it be cool if I get those like opportunities? I get like unlimited like take backsies and (laughs) I'll give them to you too. (laughs) I love this. I like that. And because it's so humble too. Like you're kind Mm -hmm. of saying, like, I might, I might screw up too. It's totally cool. Well, because I totally do, like all the time. (laughs) And it's okay. It's okay because the the conversations I'm having, they're not scripted. First yep. off, yep. Um, sure. <laughs> I'm human and I'm talking about something really complex and really hard. And sometimes I say things that I haven't thought through because I'm mm-hmm. listening when I'm listening and not yeah. thinking about what I'm going to say next. So in the conversation, I'm trying to create this environment where we can go back. We can, you know, we don't have to bite a crazy bullet. Right. Um, so I want to talk about uh, like a student. This is the same outreach, but it was a different person. <laughs> And so we're at, we're at this outreach. If this this was, I don't know if I should say the university or not. I think you can. Okay, so this is, you're not name dropping the actual student. I think it's fine to say where we were. It's well, cool. Okay, so this is St. Olaf uh, College okay. in Minnesota, and the student was in like debate club. I think it was debate club in high school, though. I don't think it was like a debate club with the college. Okay. And he had said he was trained in debate to always bite a bullet like it in the rebuttal stage like if they're bringing up like something like if you're going to be consistent you have to accept this thing always accept it never back down wow. never lose ground which you i just think trained that way trained that way so oh. when we're having him bite these explosive bullets he's saying these most outrageous things and he's just like yep okay yep okay wow i'm like wait what's going on here <laughs> you know and i just think that this is demonstrative of Debate style, you can bite the bullets all day. Yeah. Dialogue style, you don't have to bite the bullet. Yeah. You can back down. You can change yeah. your mind. I mean, in a debate, what are you trying to do? You're trying to win the crowd. Right. There's no crowd here. Like, you know, right. like we say a lot of times, it's just you and me. We're right. actually trying to find real world solutions to a real world problem. Yeah. Abortion doesn't exist in a vacuum. Right. It's affecting our families. It's affecting our community. It's affecting our culture. So, like, let's find solutions together in this conversation. Right. Let's not try to see who's the smarter person or who is the more well-read person. Let's try to figure out what we should be doing, what's ethical in this real circumstance of pregnancy. It's it's like an interesting example of how someone could get trained to do one thing Mm -hmm. really well, but then 
when they go and try to apply that to this other thing that's actually different, they might mm-hmm. not realize it's different, but it is different. Mm-hmm. It can totally mess them up. Like I can think like even like music, like there's certain things I do, mm-hmm. you know, if I'm playing in like a rock band that I should not apply to worship <laughs> music on Sunday morning. Right. Yeah. And so it's like, like, cause that would be like, wait, but I've been like trained up to always add blues riffs when, yes. whenever I can. It's like, yeah, but we're, it's like a different thing. And you, so like dialogue and <laughs> what guy? I was thinking if you grew up as a theater kid yeah. and that's how you learned how to put makeup on and then you're trying to go on oh, a first gosh. date. <laughs> Right. They're like, different it, things. It, it doesn't apply. Maybe you're really good at doing makeup for theater. Right. <laughs> Maybe it's a different skill set, <laughs> different selection on a first date in real life. I think it's the same kind of thing with debate and dialogue. Yeah. They're yeah. not the same mm-hmm. thing. And and it seems more like the same thing. Like it's more obvious to people hearing, yes, rock music is different than like, at least in most, most worship <laughs> bands. So, but uh, dialogue and debate, like I think mm-hmm. for a lot of people, it feels like the same thing. They're in this mode. Like I'm trying to change the other person's mind, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, but in a debate, it, like it makes sense to me that the kid was trained that way. Yeah. Because if you're an audience and you watch someone concede ground, like you're like, ooh, he's really on the ropes here. But in dialogue, no, 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 we want to actually have an honest exchange of ideas. It's actually a really, really good thing. It's, it's that Ted Cohen line from that TED Talk. If argument equals war, then learning equals losing. Mm-hmm. Okay, we don't want people feeling like this is a war or mm-hmm. like or like learning would be losing. We want everyone to feel like learning's winning for both of us. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times when we're in this biting the bullet mode, it's because we're too abstract. We need to bring mm. it real world. So I'm going to give a practical tip. Okay. Um, I don't have this written in the notes, Josh, but this is a practical tip okay. from you to me. Um, <laughs> really? <laughs> at an outreach. Okay. This is when I was a student still. So I'm at the outreach with you. Mm-hmm. And I remember I'm talking to the student who later she ended up in a women's studies class with me. I never brought up the conversation to her because it was too awkward for me. But like, I remember... I remember clear as day, I know her name, I'm not gonna say it, but I remember the student and I'm talking with her. It was horrific because we got into, I tried it out the toddler. I, this, I mean, are you, is this at the outreach now or are you talking outreach. about, okay. This is at the outreach. So, so I, and you talked to her or I talked to her? I talked to her okay. for like 20 minutes maybe. Okay. But I ended up ending the conversation with her saying, we can kill children up to seven years old <gasps> because they're not like self-sufficient enough to contribute to society until they're like seven or eight. Like the like age of reason they can think critically and like it okay. was horrible. Just say as someone who's talked to, I don't know, 1500 <laughs> pro-choice people or something yeah. like that. E- that's even an explosive round to me. Like I've heard mm-hmm. almost no one say up to seven years old. Like that's like now the Lucas Graham song stuck in my head. But like yeah. up to seven years old. We- oh my goodness. Well, that's this crazy. is because this is before I had re- received biting the bullet training. So, <laughs> so what you do? <laughs> well, well, she had bit the bullet on infanticide. Uh-huh. And I didn't know what to do. I was like, oh, you're okay with killing babies after they're born? And she was like, well, I'm okay with parents making that decision, not right. like just regular people. Sure. But if you're the parent of the child, yes. And I was like, what? So <laughs> I'm like, so like, where's the cutoff for you? And she's like, well, I'm not really sure. I'm like, well, three years old? She's like, eh, it's, it's okay. Four years old? So I just, I just kept going because I didn't know. Right. I'm like, do you think it's okay to kill me? Like, <laughs> right. If like, my, can my mom come kill me right now and you're not going to stop her? Like, right. I don't know. What, where's your cutoff? Right. So then we had found out where, where she was and I was freaked out. Anyway, so the practical <laughs> tip is, so I go over to Josh and I'm like a distressed student. And I remember saying, here's what she said to me. And you said. I don't remember this conversation that's at okay. all, by that's the okay. way. Outreach, like outreach blindness like it really make it, it disrupts your memory because yeah. it's such a long day it's so exhausting to talk to people all day about abortion i think a lot of times our memory is just like yeah they don't that's why we take notes at outreach sometimes, so what like did i phone. say you said if someone says something that's really disturbing or really disgusting it's okay and important to express disgust hmm. so if someone is going to look you in the eye and say i think it's okay to kill babies after they're born yeah it's okay for you to react to that. I wouldn't overreact, but it's okay for you to say, are you kidding me right now? Like, hmm. that's that makes me sick to my stomach. That's gross. Yeah. You think it's okay to kill seven-year-olds? Yeah. That's very alarming. I don't know how you came to that worldview, but it's freaking me out here. Right. It makes me uncomfortable. It, th- and I think expressing disgust, I mean, a lot of times another bullet people will bite. We're not going to go too much into this today maybe, but um, rape. Yeah. Sometimes... People, and we are going to get into this a little bit later, but sometimes I have had people, yep. unfortunately, more than I would like to say, say, you know, I think sometimes rape would be okay. Right. And that might be shocking to people who haven't done a lot of outreach. Right. But people do bite these bullets yep. 
and especially in college campuses where you're in where you're dealing with philosophy students yep. they've gotten used to this mentality anyway yeah. when people say that it is pretty necessary for you to say in order to have your worldview you have to say rape is okay sometimes right like that's, that's disgusting deeply offensive that's deeply offensive that's horrific yeah so i just want to uh, put that in there and um we have yeah go 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 ahead yeah so so mm-hmm. i i want to uh, i want to get you to clarify something that yeah. i think would be helpful um but it's, okay <laughs> i still don't remember this conversation it's, it's probably good <laughs> advice um but we also have talked before, and this is like a practical dialogue tip, and Tim wrote an article a while ago, and I've talked about this in public before, is this idea of telling people that they can't offend us, mm-hmm. like trying to make them feel safe. Because sometimes we're talking to, you know, like I, I know millennials get a really bad rap, but we're talking <laughs> to like specifically like Gen Z people who really don't want to offend. Um, and, you know, they've seen people get in really, really big trouble for saying something that ends up being offensive to somebody. Mm-hmm. And so, like, I've seen pro-choice people actually walking on eggshells around me. Mm-hmm. And so we'll say, you know, we'll, we'll try to say, like, look, you can't offend me. Like, you can't offend me, like, by, by using, you know, swear words or or saying, cause it's just being very specific that you believe that abortion should be legal up to six months. I'm like, no, I'm glad that you told me that. I'm glad to have that clarity. Mm-hmm. Don't worry. You, you can't defend me unless you like you really try unless you're like insulting my mom or something like that like you're probably not it, 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 this is like a safe place mm-hmm. so ca- help kind of compare and contrast that with where you're saying like in in these cases where if they say like yeah we can abort five-year-olds like like saying that that's a defensive thing is there a contradiction there or do those work together i mean i would say i'm not personally offended mm-hmm. i'm not gonna like stop talking to them or something like that but I'm disgusted by their view. I'm mm-hmm. disgusted by their position and the things that they're saying. Yeah. And I think that that's different. Um, and yeah, like even if someone like insulted me to my face, you know, and got really personal with it or something, mm-hmm. I mean, that's just not going to be the same kind of person as the tell them you can't offend you dialogue tip. Yeah. Usually that's going to be the other side of the spectrum. Mm. But I mean, yeah, I don't think, I think we should have thick skin at outreach for sure and i think that there's a difference between i'm really offended so i don't want your viewpoint i disagree with around me right right because i'm going to be triggered by that i don't want that free speech on my college campus that's a very different issue than um you are racist and that's disgusting right you know and so i think you can you can find someone's position offensive right but still listen to it and want them to express it to you so you can dialogue with it. them and make arguments i think that's a really good mm-hmm. point like you, you, it, it, it would be very very appropriate to say to like an actual racist mm-hmm. that, like that's racist like just like say <laughs> it like that's yeah. that's that's messed up I mean, mm-hmm. like like that kind of thing i think i agree it's a very appropriate thing so tip number two on here would be to actually ask if they're bluffing mm-hmm. you know like like is this a thing that you actually believe or 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 is this like a thing that are you, are you just saying this? And I would play it really chill. I mean, my style at Outreach is like, I try to be like, I'm very uptight in person sometimes. <laughs> no <laughs> <But> comment. I, <laughs> no comment. But like, <laughs> I'm like the Leslie Nope of the office. She but is. I try to play like April really Ludgate is. when I'm on campus, you know? So I'm like, really? You really think that? Like, are you just kidding me? Like, right. Are you like Paul Malik here? Or you like really think you could kill babies? Like, and, and that's and, and it's helpful to have mm-hmm. that stuff because it's such an intense topic. Mm-hmm. It's such an emotional topic. Like this is why you know we talk about and I, this is one of the episodes that that, that we are um, getting ready to release that we that we recorded a while back was like the value of having humor mm-hmm. in your dialogue. Like it's it's kind of a similar thing. It's like it's like you know generally try to like act kind of chill don't act like you're like freaked out that you're talking to someone who disagrees with you or whatever mm-hmm. like 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 be chill and yeah. and normal yeah so there's like a i think you're bluffing right now like lay your cards on the table <laughs> right. show me if you have those kings super in your hand. intense confrontational yeah. Yeah. don't do that i don't think that's gonna work because if, <laughs> if someone's like yeah i don't think you have a full house and i'm like yeah i do i'm gonna double down right but if you're like you really have a full house you're just like throwing the money right. in the pile like we bluffing right there's a difference. And I think the like second one, you're going to make some progress there. So, yeah. um, but what if they don't b- back down? You ask yeah. if they're bluffing, you're playing it chill. Right. They're like, and nope, this is my actual <laughs> they're view. Like, no, I actually really think you can, you know, kill babies after they're born. Then I'm going to admit that we can't make any more progress on abortion because we have this other thing that's really big right. that we disagree on. Right. And I- I'm bringing clarity to the conversation. Okay. 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 Now I know why we disagree on abortion. 
because there's this other really big thing that we disagree about. Like, I really, really think that we disagree because I don't think you can kill babies after they're born, and you do. And so if we disagree about that, of course we're going to disagree about abortion. I think we should talk about infanticide now. Like, let's put abortion off to the side, you know, and and emphasize that. And I think that when you bring the clarity of the conversation, oh, we're not going to make any more progress on this ethical issue because you think – you're saying very clearly – that rape is okay sometimes. Ooh, we probably have a really different worldview. <laughs> like, yeah. It's so not, like, it's like yeah. A, like a really clear case. So like, mm-hmm. if, if they're biting a seven-year-old bullet, mm-hmm. okay, like yeah. you know, the, the, the seven-year-old kid, their parents would be able to abort them. Yeah. Like, you shouldn't still be talking about embryos at this point, mm-hmm. like because em- embryos are a less clear case of persons yeah. than seven-year-olds. And so it's like this is the point that I made at the Students for Life conference uh, several years ago. Is like, look. If they're biting one of these bullets, mm-hmm. that's like like this is an area where you're you usually have common ground with pro-choice people, but <laughs> yeah. in this case, you don't at least seem to have this common ground. Um, then it's like this is one of those cases where it's perfectly appropriate and correct to kind of abandon the abortion topic and move to this other, like what ought to be a more obvious thing. But it's mm-hmm. like, how are you going to find common ground on eight-week embryos? If you don't have common ground on seven-year-old children, like like you're right. just not going to, so yeah. go talk about the thing. Don't feel bad. Don't feel like you're betraying the unborn or something like that. Like right. you're trying to help this person who has a mm-hmm. really messed up view, mm-hmm. at least with every indication that they're giving you. So talk about that thing. Like if they think you can kill seven-year-olds, then you're probably going to disagree about a lot of things mm-hmm. that are really big yeah. that you can talk about and try to help them out of that first. Yeah. And then once they're out of that bad thinking— then you can get further on the abortion issue. Right. Yeah. And, and and there's an implication to this tip that I want to draw out for mm-hmm. a minute because this is – I find myself talking about this more and more often in, like, Q&A settings. Like, you've been bringing this in because it's like – I just feel like um, this is a thing that pro-life people, I think, sometimes don't understand. This is that it is okay – to actually be the one that initiates the end of a conversation sometimes. Yes, this is so important. Because sometimes we're talking to people who are perfectly willing to hang out with us mm-hmm. all day. <laughs> like there are some of those, like yeah. it's frustrating because there's also there are times where it's hard for us to get a conversation going, right? Mm-hmm. If you've been at outreach, you've had that experience of waiting by yourself. Like you just keep on trying to get into a thing with people walking by and no one's stopping for like a half an hour. It's really frustrating. I get mm-hmm. that. But then you've got other cases where there's a lot of people around, but you've got this one I remember talking to this anarcho-capitalist at um, (laughs) at College of Sequoias in 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 Visalia, and um, and I wrote and I wrote an article about this. It was how Mm -hmm. to graciously end an unproductive dialogue or something like that. We'll 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 link to it. Um, But but I remember like when I I was getting ready to end the conversation with him, I actually asked him. I was like, "You'd be willing to talk to me about this all day, wouldn't you?" He was Mm -hmm. like, "Yes." He was like, (laughs) "Excitedly, Mm -hmm. yes." If you'll do that with me, I will hang out here for three more hours and talk about anarcho capitalism. And 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 I graciously ended because there are other people I needed to be talking to. And but Christians, I think especially, sometimes get into this way of thinking where it's like, like like they feel called or obligated to spend as much time with someone as the other person is willing mm-hmm. to give them. Um, and and I want to say that's not true. And this is a point that my friend Jonathan Fincher, who's another apologist, told me that I just love this. this, this he said, Christians make the mistake some, uh, often of trying to force feed arguments into people's mouths who don't want them. Right. This is a mistake. Mm-hmm. If, 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 and, and similarly, if this is not going well, um, then and this is like an unproductive conversation. It is a good thing to end it, and there's mm-hmm. a there's a good way to do it. You should do it graciously. Don't be a jerk about it. But you are not obligated to stand here and deal with a very very difficult person who's being obnoxious and aggressive and mean and spend there for three hours just getting beat up on basically mm-hmm. just because. They're they, like they don't have a class to go to right now, like to protect yourself for your own health. Mm-hmm. You need to be willing to end conversations that are that, that are just not going to go anywhere. Yeah, especially if you're at a pro-life event, you have a very limited amount of time. You're there to do something and have those conversations. Right. I think you need to have in-depth conversations. That's where the magic happens. Right. But also if you, you're not there to waste your time, right. if you're not at an outreach event like that, Maybe you have a little bit more time, right. but I also think about it like you have limited 
pro-life currency. Mm -hmm. Everybody has only so much abortion they can take in a day. And if you're a really active pro-life advocate, you need to invest where you're going to get a return on investment. And sometimes people just want to like run you into the ground. They want to waste your time or they're, they're arguing with you, but not in good faith. Yeah. That happens a lot on social media. And I just think that a lot of pro-life advocates would do well to end conversations earlier than they do oftentimes. Um, Let's see. I want to, I want to make sure we keep moving through here. Um, Well, one of the things I want to say even when someone won't admit they're bluffing, mm-hmm. I think sometimes, like, in my mind, I'm like, I really think they are bluffing, but they don't right. want to admit it. Right. And that so definitely happens. <laughs> the way I'm ending the conversation, I'm kind of doing a both and. Like, mm. I'm ending it, I'm not, like, calling them out on faking it, but I'm ending it in a way, like, in case they are faking it, or even if they aren't, this is going to work both ways. Yeah. So I kind of want to talk through, like, how I'm ending the conversation. Yes. So I might say something like, okay, so... I think we've discovered today that in order to be consistently pro-choice, in order to keep your pro-choice view, you also had to admit that you're an extremist on this thing. Right. Like, in order to be consistently pro-choice, you also had to say that squirrels are people. Right. I just think that's a really, really extreme thing. And so I think it's important for you to think through, wow, to be pro-choice and be consistent, I also have to be extremist on this thing. And you said you're an extremist on that. And... I believe you or, you know, you could say something like, right. and I, I hear that, but in case you ever rethink that squirrels are people like idea, if you rethink that, I want you to reconsider your pro-choice view mm. because now that you've changed your view on that thing, maybe it'll change your view on abortion. Right. So you're kind of doing it both and, yeah. or like we talked about earlier with the sovereign zone view, you know, in order to say that abortion is justified by my body, my choice, bodily autonomy stuff. You also had to admit that we should have legal accessible abortion in the ninth month of pregnancy. Right. That's a really extreme view. And so if you become really uncomfortable and you don't want to support late term abortion, then I think you should ab- abandon this argument or you know, you can push there. Right. And so you're just pointing out how extreme this is in hopes that they're gonna walk away with that pebble in their shoe. Yep. They have cognitive dissonance, yep. they're uncomfortable, and that works really well for people changing their minds after the conversation yeah you're setting them up to think more about this and not just be able to like tuck it down and push it away right you want them to walk away and wrestle and be like i saw what a late-term abortion looks like today right and i had to say i'm okay with that right what am i doing right and this goes back to one of my favorite articles on our blog um uh, bodily rights arguments necessitate extremism, yeah. um, which came out of this experience that we had at Aquinas College, I yeah. think, where, where I had this you know, outreach display. This is what Jacob ended up calling the worst conversation he'd ever seen in his <laughs> life. You're so mad. But like, I had this like quick kind of back and forth with mm-hmm. this pro-choice girl who made a bodily rights argument. And I tried to I tried to explain the thing we explained at the beginning of the episode. Like it seems like, you know, uh, you can't be you know for any restrictions on abortion if you're saying you can do whatever you want with anything inside of your body. And and her reaction wasn't to concede the point. Her reaction was to dig her heels and she's like, "Huh, you're right. I guess I shouldn't <laughs> believe in any restrictions on abortion." And then she's like, "Well, I've got to go to class. Goodbye." And she walks away. And I'm like, "Wait a minute, I'm not done yet." You know. Um, and Jacob's like. What just happened? Did you just make her more pro-choice? Like, is that a win? So our staff had an entire conversation. You were there. Yeah. Um, we had a whole conversation about that because Jacob was, like, legitimately upset. He was like, we got to stop doing this, you guys. This is not working. This he was backfired. not happy. And in our view um, that, that Tim ended up writing in, in his article was like, no, that girl was actually better off when she walked away. Mm-hmm. Because what we want to do is we want to drive the comfortable pro-choice position extinct. Mm -hmm. And she came to that table with an inconsistent but comfortable pro-choice position. She walked away with a consistent but uncomfortable pro-choice position. That's a win. We want when people bite the bullet to walk away like, okay, so to win that argument, because in their view they're trying to Mm -hmm. win, to win, I had to say that seven-year-olds are not persons. That's not good. Like we want Mm -hmm. them walking away with that. That's a win. That's a good thing. And I, cause that's why I love what you're doing here is you're trying to, like, I didn't have the chance to do it with that girl because she, like, literally walked away mm-hmm. really quick. But, like, you're saying, like, try to kind of put a spotlight 
Mm -hmm. on uh, like help them connect these dots because hopefully if they do walk away if they walk away already they know they don't really believe this Mm -hmm. thing we want them to understand what that naturally leads to them because a lot of the time people that are pro-choice they're pro-choice because they feel more comfortable doing that Mm -hmm. it's very Mm hands-off well i don't want to tell anyone what they Mm -hmm. can and cannot do i just you know it's up to them and that way i can just sit off to the side i'm removed i don't have the blood on my hands I don't have to say I support abortion because I don't like abortion. Right. But uh, me being pro-choice, that allows me to stay the heck out of it. Right. And you know what? That's not true. Yeah. That's not what the pro-choice position is. Right. And so, like, having that spotlight on there and, and helping them now be pro-choice and uncomfortable is so much better for that person's conversion. Yeah. So I just want to totally uh, address agree with that. that. I think let's, it's really good. Let's move on to the four types of uh, biting the bullet that we're going to talk about today. Okay. Um, I kind of try to want to breeze through. This first one might be a little bit long because I think we have like three different stories to go right, with it. Right. Um, but they're they're fun stories. So we lovingly call them squirrel biters because that's like. <laughs> I don't know, just like a funny visual in think, my head. I think that just happened when we recorded this podcast <laughs> the first time. I think yeah. So, because this happens a lot, mm-hmm. you, you, because because we talk about squirrels all the time. If yeah. you haven't, again, if you haven't gotten our course, then you might not know <laughs> that. But when we teach the eco rights argument, like one of the things that we're doing is we're is we're comparing, um, you know, people's you know different views of person, and we're kind of like looking at like, okay, well, what would that mean in the case of squirrels and newborns? Are kind of the right. two cases that we talk about the most often. Right. Um, and so, like, would this mean that you know, like, if so, if your view is that as soon as you're minimally aware of the world around you, you're now in. So, like, early embryos aren't in, uh, maybe late term fetuses are, but now squirrels are mm-hmm. in the equal right to life circle. Squirrels to get equal rights because they're very, very sentient. Like, they're totally mm-hmm. minimally aware of the world around them and, and even more so. So, it seems like that's a problem with the view. And sometimes people are like, <laughs> sure. I guess so. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, we, we essentially are doing like a litmus test. Yeah. with the definition of personhood that they have in their mind. We're yes. trying to help them think through what is a person mm-hmm. and a lot of the like f- ideas and uh, definitions that are kind of floating out in the ether, they're making a really big mistake. And to be consistent, we're going to have to either exclude newborn babies or include squirrels. And right. so when people want to include squirrels and the whole animal kingdom, we sometimes call them squirrel biters. I mean, I just think internally, people, people who, yeah, we don't call not, them that to, not their, to their face. face. Not You're, a, You're a squirrel, squirrel biter. biter. Because awkwardly, <laughs> well, the most awkward part is most commonly someone who's going to bite the bullet on animals yeah. is also a vegan. Right. So awkwardly, they're a squirrel biter. It's like, yeah. that's, yeah. Anyway, it's funny to us. But when we push them on this point, when they bite this bullet, yeah. there's a really good way to do it. And then there's like an okay way to do it. So, Josh, I have a practical tip for, like, how we should talk about squirrel, like, when we're talking about squirrel biters, like, yeah. how we should talk about it. Yeah. But first, like, I want you to tell uh, a story, like, how do you usually set this up? Right. So, there's a story that I've told sometimes. I don't tell this as often because there was another pro speaker who had a really, <laughs> really similar story. Like, we are telling <laughs> almost the exact same thing, and I was worried, like, it looked like now, basically, neither of us tell the story. But I used to tell the story. Okay. It's a true story. Mm-hmm. When I was driving in Georgia, I used to drive on my way to work. I drove literally through a Civil War battlefield. Every mm-hmm. day, it was this really beautiful forest over by Kennesaw Mountain. If you, if you, if you live in in Georgia, I was driving through that, and there's like a civil war battlefield over there. Mm-hmm. And so I'm on my way to work, and a squirrel literally darted in front of my car, and Death I wish. didn't, I didn't, <laughs> right, I didn't try to hit the squirrel. It did right. this like kamikaze thing in front of my car, and I unfortunately did not miss the squirrel. And so mm-hmm. my, I, I, I so remember the moment where my car went kachunk, yeah, and I knew I'd hit it. And I look in my mirror, like right away, I look in my rear view mirror because what I'm wanting to see is that it's dead, right? Yeah. Like, I, like I don't want it to be like, you know, like I'm imagining a scrat from Ice Age, like every time something <laughs> horrible happens yes. to this poor animal, he's like, <laughs> you know, like, it's just like this awful twitching thing. Like, I didn't want that to yeah. actually be going on for this poor squirrel that didn't know what it was doing. Um, and like, and I could see it was really, really, really oh, dead. Mm-hmm. And kind of the joke uh, that I and this other pro-life speaker would always, we always make this point, like, it's not like I pulled over the car. Mm-hmm. It's not like I went and like did it CPR. <laughs> right. Yeah, I didn't call the police mm-hmm. or an ambulance. Like, I just went to work. And no one thinks that's weird. But if that same thing had happened with a kid... And I'd just gone to work. Mm-hmm. Like, I should be in jail. There'd be, like, a really, really different situation. Now, 
you have a tip that I think takes like the idea of telling this story and actually makes it a lot better mm -hmm. than how I used to tell the story with with British people I want to get to be able to talk about. Yeah, because I have like I've heard a lot of pro life advocates ask questions like, you know, would you would you get the same amount of jail time or like is is killing a squirrel different than killing a, a toddler or something like that? Right. I think telling a context telling it in context of a story like this and making it really humorous really funny you know you're kind of like maybe exaggerating like how you felt in the moment like i have run over bunnies before that makes it sound really bad okay i've run over a bunny before okay maybe you're not two a serial bunnel, bunny killer <laughs> right? and and it is like it makes my heart pound a mile a minute i feel like yeah. sick to my stomach and i'm like i just killed a bunny i just killed a living thing and it's it's scary for me it like ruins my whole morning if that right. happens right but you're and saying so, to tell the story mm -hmm. well. Make tell it story an well. interesting story. Exactly. Get them, like, on the edge of their seat as much as you can. Try to make them maybe laugh about it, like, relate to it, ask them if they've ever killed a squirrel before or something, and really talk through that. Instead of just asking them, do you think killing squirrels and, and people are the same, like, you know, if they're biting that bullet, because I want you to, as soon as you tell the humorous story, pause and ask them a question. I want you to say, what would you think about me if I had just told that same story about killing a toddler? Like if I ran over a toddler with my car, would we be laughing about it right now and joking about it? And like me, like apologizing to you for like, I'm sorry, I killed a, a bunny, you know, a squirrel. Right. And you just said, you think that's a person. Like, I'm so sorry. Like, am I a murderer? Like if we were like laughing and being jovial about that and I did the same thing with a toddler. Right. If, and, and in your case, you know, with the CPR thing, like, Imagine if I'd ran over that toddler with my car and I don't pull over and right. go try to give it CPR. I don't even call the police. I just hit and run, keep right. going. Right. And I'm like, oh, I'm glad it's not twitching behind me. Like, who? Right. Would have been a worse day if it was. There's this like shift that you're doing yeah. where you're where, where, like the, 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 there's there's uh, there's one tone as you tell the story. And then it's a more serious tone when you ask about the toddler or, or, or whatever it is, because you're you're wanting them to take this question very mm -hmm. seriously and so it's just it's just going to be more effective than, than just straight up asking do you think that there's a difference between squirrels and people like it's yeah. Just, yeah i think there's like a psychological experience thinking about the humor and the lightheartedness that was happening a minute ago right and if that would have been applied to joking right. about killing a baby right. because that i think is gonna somehow i don't know like i'm trying to have it resonate with their moral compass yeah. i'm trying to get that like natural common sense ethics thing that we all have right i want to like i don't want to say trigger that in like a negative way but like i want i want to make that bell ring in their head right. of wow yeah i really don't think squirrels are equal to people like you and i right and i think that your the moral compass is going to go along with that a little bit more if you're telling it in context of a story and having that contrast i have watched a crowd laugh at your eye speakers tell a story about killing a squirrel mm -hmm. and really just like the crowd's going wild they're loving the story they think it's really funny right. and kind of awkward and everyone's relating to it and then when we pause and we say now imagine if this whole room had been reacting the same way and i was telling a story about a, a, a kid put right. put a human child in that position and just you could hear a pin drop like it is a weird emotional experience in the room for everybody to wrestle with right and I think it really is persuasive. I think it helps us a lot. Yeah. There's a few other stories that I've told that kind of like give some examples of like maybe ways that we mm -hmm. push against people who specifically bite the squirrel bullet. Because um, often there's kind of an, like an animal rights thing going mm -hmm. on here. And and like, first of all, like, you know, I, I, I'm generally going to try to show common ground. Like I'm for sure I'm not mm -hmm. for torturing animals. You know, I, I, I think that there are legitimate concerns like moral concerns about factory farming and, and what we do in in, in in factory farming i'm i'm not convinced that you know like mm -hmm. sea world like we should have like killer whales and dolphins in there yeah i oftentimes tell people like i think animals should have some rights just not the same rights as you and i do yes mm -hmm. yeah i think that's really helpful so like, the, the, the clearest way i know to say is like if, if, if 50 elephants get rounded up in a field and killed that's really wrong i'm not mm -hmm. just like shrugging off like whatever they're elephants they're mm -hmm. not they're not people it's really wrong because of what elephants can do and because of what we know about elephants and 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 our responsibilities to 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 act you know appropriately mm -hmm. and morally but if instead 50 humans got rounded up into that field and killed, I'm saying I think that's even more wrong. They're yeah. not the same for me, even though they're both 
mm-hmm. wrong. But like, there's different ways that that like, I'll try to kind of push and see. Like again, like are they bluffing or do they really believe that these things are equal? Because we'll have people say they literally think yeah. that humans and animals are equal. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the story that I tell the most often is is, is, is kind of fun. Is I was on. Um, a train one time. I, I, I just did an outreach with Justice for All at Pasadena City College. I took a bus up to uh, Bakersfield and took a train from Bakersfield to, to Fresno, which was a much better experience than the <laughs> bus drive. Um, but I'm on this train. I'm sitting at like this restaurant. Like There's like a table in front of me. It's like a booth. Mm-hmm. And so I've got my laptop out and I'm working. And this guy sits across from me. Um, and and we started talking. We started talking mm-hmm. about robotics because he's reading this this this, this book on, on 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 robotics. And then he asked me about what I do. So I told him like a th- couple of minutes on this like experience that's had yeah. doing this outreach. I'm, I talked to people about uh, uh, about abortion. And then as part of that, I don't usually talk about this, but I mentioned this thing. I was like, I've just been noticing lately. But like, I talk to all kinds of people. I talk to Christians and atheists and agnostics and you know Mormons and you know Muslims like all these different kinds of people who believe like all kinds of different things and yet there's this most often there's a pretty common thread like almost everyone that I talk to believes that there's something special about humans mm-hmm. and he and he interrupted me and said oh my, well my girlfriend doesn't agree with that <laughs> and like and I did the are you bluffing thing I'm like really like are you like there's really you know and he's like no I'll prove it to you if she ever <laughs> accidentally kills a fly and then this is like a peek behind the curtain of my dumb brain because I'm like, how do you accidentally kill a fly? And like, and it's like really hard. <laughs> right. See a ninja, you know, whatever. Right. Anyway, I don't think it's what he meant. So what, 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 he, what he meant was he actually like steps on a bug. Mm-hmm. Clearly is what he meant. And so it's like he's like, if he ever accidentally steps on a bug, she has a moment of silence. <laughs> and there's Whoa. this like pregnant pause. Yeah. And I'm just like thinking about this now. Like I turn away and I'm just like, I'm like pondering this, this moment. And I turn to him and said... I don't think the sea thinks that humans and animals are the same, and I'll prove it to you. If she ever accidentally ran over a kid, she wouldn't just have a <laughs> moment of silence, right? Like, right. like, like, she's, like she's not just going to, like, you know, like, it's probably going to be the worst thing that ever happens to her. It's, like, it's going to at least wreck her day. If she's not just going to get out of the car and be like, namaste and move on. It's going to be, like, it's going to be a thing, right? right? And, and I know this is a California stereotype, but I, 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 I really, I'm serious what he said. Dude. Dude. And he like, now he turns away to ponder. <laughs> and he starts like shaking his finger and he turns to me and says, I think you're right. <gasps> I'm gonna talk to her about that day. I'm sure it's like an amazing, you know, evening for them. So like so like mm-hmm. this is a, this is like a way for me to kind of like really try to show him like, hey, like, is this really like here's mm-hmm. a reason why not to think that they think the same. Mm-hmm. Now, I've had people bite that bullet. So just to give people all the tools in the toolbox, I'll tell you the furthest that we go. This is like, in a certain sense, the meanest that we'll get with right. like an extreme animal rights activist. Because this is a horrible story that we're going to tell an animal rights person. But like, I'm tr- I want to get to the common ground. I want to get them to concede a little bit of ground so we can try to find some common ground and maybe try to like figure something out. Because a lot of times when you're talking with, I think this last one is really helpful for vegans because yeah. vegans have spent a lot of time thinking about yeah. Animal rights, mm-hmm. animal personhood, questioning that in their mind. You know, there's a lot of good reasons to be against, like, meat industry stuff. Right. But, but I think sometimes they haven't thought through it in this particular way. So why don't you talk about that? Right. And, again, we're trying to get their moral compass to think clearly about this particular issue. Right. Not necessarily trying to talk them out of veganism or anything like that. Right. But are animals people, too? Right. Like, yeah. So, we're, like, we're not making fun of vegans. Like, again, like, I'll tell vegans, like, you might be taking this more seriously, like, like you might, like, appropriately mm-hmm. more seriously than I am. And maybe I've got the problem. Maybe I'm, maybe I should be vegan. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I just haven't spent enough time thinking about it or, or understanding what you understand. Like, I'm open to that idea. We can have that conversation. I just currently do not believe that humans and animals are exactly the same. And, and so, here's the phrase that will go. Um, so, Tim used to live with this 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 guy this roommate i'm not going to name who the roommate is um, because i don't know if that guy tells the story um or or wants people to know this but (laughs) anyway tim's old roommate was a hunter okay Mm -hmm. and so we'll tell the the, the vegan stories like i'll 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 tell them so i I know this guy who used to live with a hunter and this hunter and and i've heard specifically the story about how this one day this hunter went out he stalked a deer he shot it he brought it home he skinned it and he made sausage out of it and they ate it for breakfast the next morning. Um, and, of course, like, 
the animal rights activist is going to be like, oh my gosh, like it's like it's like, right, like, like triggered, you know right. what I mean? Like, well, they're like, like, I'm obviously against that. Right. Like, at, at the very least, they'd be like, of course, I think that's wrong. Let's Definitely think that. that's wrong. It's like, mm-hmm. okay, totally track on why you would think that's wrong. Like, what do you think should happen to that hunter? Like, like in an ideal world, the, if the laws are what they ought to be, like, what should what 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 should happen? Um, and I've heard people say, like, I think he ought to be in jail. I, like, I, frankly, I, I think he should go to jail for that. It's like, okay, totally tracking. That makes sense to me based on what you what, what what you've explained to me your view to be. Do you have a sense for like how long they should go to jail? I'm not looking for like an exact amount, but do you have like any sense for like what that ought to look like? And I feel like I usually hear people say something like, you know, like three or six months. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to be like, okay, three or six months? Like you said you think humans and animals are the same. So what if that story that I just told you, what, what, if, what if the hunter did that to a girl? Okay? And, mm-hmm. I, and I will explicitly connect the dots because I feel like people don't always mm-hmm. – ex- okay. What if the hunter that I just mentioned stalked a girl, shot her, brought her home, skinned her, made sausage out of her, and ate her for breakfast the next morning. Served it up to his roommate. Right. Yeah. Like, he should be in a Hannibal Lecter mask talking to Jodie Foster all day, okay? Like, he's just, like, for the rest of his life. Like, there's no three to six months. Like, that's not how we think about that. And I think that there's a reason for that. Um, And, like, this is kind of the... The last ditch effort. Sometimes we've got a last ditch effort that we'll try. We do that with people who bite the like the the, the lid of my bullet too. This is my last ditch effort with an animal rights person. And the thing is, it's not just like how much damage has he done, how like wrong is that thing, like right. three to six months just like to discourage people from killing deer or something like that. I think it's more the kind of place you have to be in psychologically mm-hmm. to stomach like the moral callous of an action like that. Yeah. Making a young woman into sausage, the moral callous and the kind of like thinking that goes into that sort of action, that's because she's a person right. like you and I. Right. And the deer is not. And so people's moral compass is different about that. Right. And I think, so I, I used to do like some research into veganism. I was very interested in it for a while. Mm-hmm. I was wrestling with it myself, and a lot of the moral arguments are that our moral compass around, like, eating meat is skewed and is off. Yeah. I'm like, is it really off that much that you're going to—is it off for you that much that you're going to give that? And we talk about intuitions in actually one of the archived episodes, um, responding to the extreme skeptic or something like that. Mm -hmm. So we can talk about, like, how intuitions are not always perfect and moral compass things. So you can look into that more, but I just think that— this question helps to isolate that as well. Right. But again, works better in context of a story. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on here. Um, we have we have a last ditch effort. Do you want to talk about this this third thing, or do you want to skip it? Um. Uh. So so this is also on people who bite the bullet on thalidomide cases. Mm-hmm. Um. So so let's talk about like first like like that idea of of shifting the burden of proof mm-hmm. um, because that's the thing that a lot of times we choose not to do. Like that's one of the things that. At ERI, I think makes us kind of unique is that we typically avoid um, shifting the burden of proof mm-hmm. um, and trying to like you know always make them defend their claim. But there are but there are, are cases where it's like they're making such an extreme claim. It's kind of like they forced us into mm-hmm. it. Like like there's nothing else we can do. So yeah. I, I like to hear you talk about that. A little so bit. yeah, so I'm not going to go into what the thalidomide argument is. We teach that in the Quit for Life course in the bodily rights section. Yep. But this is again. The bodily rights argument that says, and there's different bodily rights arguments, but this one says, I can do anything I want with anything inside my body. Yeah. Um, I have, like, complete bodily autonomy. Um, and so oftentimes we're going to use arguments to kind of push that further and further yeah. and further. And, and what would that look like? Right. But eventually, if they're biting that bullet, we are going to shift that burden of proof. Right. Which, again, we don't teach often. But we are going to say, how do you know that? How do you know we have complete bodily autonomy right um and really uh, oftentimes it's harder to create that argument to defend that view than to just criticize and say well i think i think that like no 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 no. how do you know that or or like help me understand why should i believe why should i believe that Mm -hmm. you know why 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 should i believe that like i i I, we've got common ground that there there is to some extent a Mm -hmm. very appropriate level of bodily autonomy that people ought to have i mean we're not like hey it's not in the constitution man (laughs) like it's not my view Mm -hmm. but i I just the question here is like is it an absolute right should it trump another person's right to life because that's what's Mm -hmm. going on the pro-choice argument why should i believe 
um, that her right to her body is so absolute that she can do whatever she wants with anything inside of her body. And so, yeah, so we do teach one of those last ditch efforts. I think we can mm-hmm. save that for the course. If you want to know what that is, we teach in the Equip for Life course. It's a last ditch. It's, it's the nuclear option. And I think a lot of times pro-life advocates, I've, I have heard it's pretty common to say something like, my rights end where yours begin. Mm-hmm. Like, I can't just take my fist and right. punch you in the face. Right. I don't have complete, bo- absolute bodily autonomy because it's interrupting your bodily autonomy. With pregnancy, I don't think that that's that analogous. It right. doesn't work as well. Right. Bodily rights arguments, I don't think that's actually that persuasive. The one we teach in the course is specific to pregnancy, yeah. and that's why I think it helps a lot yeah. more than the classic, like, punching you know the fist thing yeah. that's so common i feel like people wouldn't make bodily autonomy arguments for pregnancy if that if that was a persuasive argument i'm being i'm being they're they're not that dumb. yeah yeah i i don't think that they actually think that way i think that that argument comes from a misunderstanding yeah. of the pro-choice mindset and so the way that we've developed our argument it really does fit well with their worldview yeah. so and we'll link to an article that goes into more on like that kind of str- like common pro-life straw man of, mm-hmm. of bodily rights arguments because there's a meme also that like we, you see all the time that kind mm-hmm. of makes the same mistakes so if we want more on that we've got an article that we'll link to on that yeah so let's move on to something that i detest <laughs> oh okay <laughs> utilitarianism <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. which, which i want to say like we do have a video on uh utilitarianism it's one of the more advanced training videos in yeah, the course two, yeah yeah we have, module we have on one, it. one on utilitarianism and one on moral relativism which is spoiler what we're getting to next yeah. but even though i hate the topic we will talk about it a little bit. Let's talk about it a little yeah. bit. Because okay. and, and this is, I, like, I think I, you know, like, I, I'm, I, like, here's what's in my head. I'm like, would I rather talk to a utilitarian or a moral relativist? And I think probably I'd rather talk to the utilitarian. Mm-hmm. But it's, 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 a, it's a hard, it's a it's hard question. It's more in fashion right now. I feel like it's like a yes. cool, hip thing to do. Yes. Yeah, be a utilitarian. Like, well, try it on. Do it a little bit. And, and not to toot my own <laughs> horn. This mm-hmm. is going to sound like I'm tooting my own horn. I've been kind of predicting that utilitarianism mm-hmm. would grow for quite a while. I, yeah. And I have been predicting that. That relativism would 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 start going away. Yeah, um, like it's we still so see season. it. It's so last see it a season. lot in social media. But yeah, like <laughs> as far as like philosophers go, it really is. It actually is yeah. last season. Mm-hmm. Like there is a previous season of philosophers <laughs> who were teaching relativism, yeah. and then that trickled down into mm-hmm. students. Philosophers don't teach this anymore, and that's yeah. pretty rare. That any worldview is so bad that almost every professional philosopher kind of abandons it. This is one of those rare mm-hmm. <laughs> cases. Like, this is not really being taught. Um, you still see college students defend it sometimes. I see You see it more, I think, in, like, Facebook debates. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and frankly, it's, it, it would make sense to see, like, older pro-choice people do it more often mm-hmm. than younger students. Because, again, yes. a lot of times college students, they're being affected by their philosophy professors who, by now, at this point, aren't really teaching relativism. Right. So— it's dying a slow death, yeah. And I've been saying it would do that for like <laughs> eight years, and I think, and, and at least as far as we can tell from our experiences mm-hmm. on campus and talking to two philosophers, that is coming true. But I it mean, makes. Go ahead. I'm happy to see it go. Don't yes. get me wrong. I'm happy to see relatives yes. and leave, but the poison is being replaced by. Yes. I just like personally, at a personal level, I detest it yeah. because I think it's so dangerous. I, I think I so I totally agree with that. I'm yeah. not like I'm not necessarily <laughs> happy with the change just because yeah. I predicted. It's like because it's going to. Re- Placed with a tougher thing to deal with. Yes, utilitarianism is is actually less dumb than relativism is. Mm-hmm. Um, like on its face, it's pretty easy to quickly show how messed up moral relativism is. It's you know who's to say who's you know right. whether there's any objective you know right or wrong. Like utilitarianism, like most of the really smart secular philosophers are yes. some form of utilitarian. There's yes. different forms of. We're not going to go that deep into the weeds, yeah. but there's some. Form of they might not they don't all like that label, um, but like functionally that's what the worldview is doing. Sam mm-hmm. Harris, a lot of the really smart atheists, like this is where they're coming from, and, yeah. and because they're biting certain bullets mm-hmm. in the end. So utilitarianism basically says like this is kind of like you know, this is mm-hmm. this is a little bit like we're purposely not getting really really specific yeah, and deep into the weeds. There's different forms of it. Right. We're not going to get into that. But basically, it's the idea that that it is an objective worldview. So unlike relativism, which says that there is no objective moral truth, utilitarianism says, no, 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 there is an objective moral truth, but it's different than what, like, like for example, Christians mm-hmm. think is obje- like, like some kind of reflection of, of, of what God, this objective moral lawgiver, like a reflection of his nature, is that, no, 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 that's not, there's no God. 
you like what is objectively moral morally right is based on what does the most good for the most number of people it's interested in increasing pleasure and decreasing pain at like a mm -hmm. net level it's not yeah. necessarily just for a single person but like for a group like what is going to do the most good for this large group of people um, and 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 that's how you can find objectively good and, and bad things. And if you're not really familiar with like philosophy, you haven't really studied a lot, you might have heard the phrase, the ends justify the means, mm -hmm. which pretty much means this action is good because of the end result. Right. Or like it's justified yep. by that end result, like that massive net from like a really big 3,000 foot view. Yeah. Is it doing more good than bad? Yeah. That sort of thing. That's utilitarianism. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in the Equip for Life course, we teach a thought experiment on how to. That I'm not going to get into because mm -hmm. you should get the course. We use this really <laughs> good thought experiment, and in it, we also teach how to respond to the common response mm -hmm. to the utilitarian. So we don't just like here's like one level. We go like inception, another <laughs> level because there's a really kind of common like easy way for the utilitarian to try to get out of the problem. And it's like no, 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 no. Here's how to yeah. kind of like deal with that and show mm -hmm. them no, no, no. You still have this problem. Um, but instead, it's like as a kind of a like an alternative example um and we like referencing pop culture right. i think it's really good for pro-life people to reference pop culture when they can because there's this quick common ground thing mm -hmm. oh we've both watched you know pixar movies or whatever right. like we've both seen that thing this is like common experience thing um it also shows you're not like you know like you <laughs> have a tv <laughs> so like like i understand all like here's my out like i was like for like you know like homeschoolers like is mm -hmm. kind of a common example like they might not have a tv because they're concerned about like their kids getting exposed to certain things or maybe just feel like there's better uses of their time i i understand there's reasons for that i'm just saying the fact that i have seen like a lot of the like same movies the fact that i've seen in this case mm -hmm. like marvel movies i'm going to reference a marvel movie in a second like it, it shows i'm kind of like it helps them not to strum in you. They see Josh. They don't see pro-life dude on my campus. Right. Like outreach particularly is hard. We need to connect with people. Yeah. When it's your friend, they already know. Right. They already know you as a person. But right. when you're talking about something like abortion, having things in common, having them feel like they're, you guys are part of a group, yeah. even if it's just like we both like superhero movies or we're both Marvel fans or something, that helps. So, yeah, right. for sure. So, but, so a case um, that, mm -hmm. that we've talked about more recently is in Avengers. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not going to spoil anything. Um, I'm just going to explain the context that's going on, like the plot of Avengers Infinity War. But, like, you should have seen Infinity War. By and, this point, you should have seen it. So I'm not yeah. going to tell you, like, whether or not it, he's successful, <laughs> although you probably already know <laughs> because it was a huge, huge, mm -hmm. like, you know, media – like, everyone talked about this. Mm -hmm. But – uh, in the Avengers, the Marvel Universe is a really, really big bad guy for like most of you know Marvel movies. Uh, um, Thanos, this big mm -hmm. purple alien, you know, demigod like guy with the gauntlet that creature. has all the little stones on right. it and everything. Yeah. So what he's trying to do, his goal, his mm -hmm. mission, is to acquire all these magical stones, which will then give him the power to snap his fingers and literally obliterate half of life in the universe. Mm -hmm. And he wants to do this, not because he's like Hitler or something like that. What's going on for him is he's, is, he's, he's it's more like someone who's really concerned about the possibility of overpopulation. Mm -hmm. um, and he's like, I've lived, you know, like in places where like there end up being, you know, too many, you know, whether it's, you know, people or aliens or whatever you know people aliens they like and, and then like you know there's not enough resources and poverty skyrockets and no you know pretty soon people are like you know eating each other i don't remember exactly the story he that he tells as a solution to like a bunch of problems i mean right. you can kind of fill it into they don't go into a lot of things but you can fill yeah. it into like climate change lack of resources mm -hmm. overpopulation problems a lot of the things that are talked about in the real world he has found a solution and his solution right. is to wipe out Half of, let's just cut in half. Right. And he's very detached yes. from this decision. And we see that a lot. Now, he's a utilitarian. Yes. He's like a strong, very obvious case of a utilitarian mindset. Right. Mm -hmm. He's not a, there is no right or wrong. Mm -hmm. He is like, no, this is the right thing to do. Like, yes, it's tough. Like, it's, it's you know, I, I get why you might be, you know, against it kind of a thing. But look, in the end, this will be so much better for the entire universe, for all the survivors. They're going to be way better off. And look, like this snap is an instantaneous thing. It's painless. Like, like it's not like, you know, people are being tortured to death or something. It's like, look, let's just like mm -hmm. a quick kind of wipe out and help the entire universe. 
And that's what he's trying to accomplish in Infinity War. And so, like, you know, and, and we'll link to an article that 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 that, that Tim wrote about this is showing like, hey, he's a utilitarian. Mm-hmm. He'd be pro-choice, too, based on the kinds of worldview things that we see a lot of pro-choice people have. Like he's mm-hmm. he's biting those bullets. I mean, I can't think of a more explosive bullet than erasing half of the people. <laughs> right. It's pretty big. <laughs> like, like it's an explosive bullet, but he's willing to bite it. And he's like, I'm willing to make the sacrifice. I'm willing to make the tough decision. Right. I'm willing to you know, do you, you have to watch the movie, but do some yeah. things that are really hard on me to be able to succeed. So right. I, he's a utilitarian and that sort of thinking is very hard to argue with sometimes. Right. And um, we, we do a little bit in the course, give you some, some tools, but I would say a lot of people need to study philosophy to be able to argue about utilitarianism. Mm-hmm. But this is a case of if you can't change the worldview, you're not gonna make a lot of progress on abortion. Yep. If you're talking to a utilitarian that's pro-choice, it's very hard to get them out of that. You right. have to get them out of utilitarian mind, mindset first. Right. Um, and so this would be a, a case where unless you have studied philosophy, I would recommend point out the extremism, right. point out how much that must really suck for them, and exit the conversation. Yeah, like yeah. And, 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 and and graciously exit. Just be like, mm-hmm. it seems like like in the end, like my view is that there are objective right and wrong things, and it, and it's not based on just what is good for the most number of people. Because I think clearly there are cases over there's thought experiments, including the one in the course, of where yes, this would help the most people. Mm-hmm. Like you just you just say like yeah, let's just concede that point. You, let's say this would help the most people. Mm-hmm. Why is it wrong? Let's say Thanos is right. What if snapping actually does help way more people and helps life flourish all across the galaxy? Okay, but why do we still, most of us, there, there, mm-hmm. are, there are Thanos defenders, okay? <laughs> but for the rest of us, why would it be wrong for mm-hmm. him to do that if, if all of his kind of other assumptions are correct? This is an important question to at least get utilitarians hopefully thinking about mm-hmm. and maybe starting to rethink maybe their entire moral worldview. Yeah. Talk about relativism. Yeah, let's move on to relativism. So I want to point out like an important distinction that I think a lot of people, if you haven't really studied a lot, this is an easy mistake to make, very understandable mistake. Mm -hmm. So when you think about relativism, a lot of people will talk about, well, there's no absolute truth. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a truth relativist. A lot of relativists that are well-read, that are smarter, they, they thought about it more, they're not truth relativists. Yep. They believe that there is absolute truth. For example, the earth has always been flat. Or, no, <laughs> I can't believe I just said, no, the earth has always been round. For goodness sake. Flat, Rachel, flat earth exposed. I know, right? No, the, Someone's <laughs> going to take that clip now. <laughs> um, the, the, the earth has always been round. People were wrong about it being flat for a while. Right. They were absolutely wrong. Right. There, there is absolute truth about something like gravity something like right. the earth being round but there's no absolute truth about something like morality right something like abortion there's no absolute it's right or wrong right. in this circumstance it's right or wrong no they think that it's relative to the circumstance to the culture to everything else yep. and so that's like a moral relativist truth relativist i'm not gonna say they don't exist because i've been on the internet right <laughs> but i'm saying they've seen a lot of things they're a lot more rare and so yeah Make sure not to conflate these two things. Yeah. When you're dealing with a moral relativist, there's going to be two different types. There's going to be, I'm flirting with moral relativism because I just heard about it recently. I'm into it, whatever. I'm going right. through a phase. Right. <laughs> and there's like, I'm in a committed relationship with relativism. <laughs> <laughs> I've made vows or whatever. It's casual dating versus <laughs> yeah. they're engaged. Right. And if you're dealing with somebody who's committed, they're in a committed relationship with moral relativism, it's going to be a lot harder to get them out of that. Yeah. I'm not saying you can't, right. but I'm saying it's going to take a lot more effort. It's going to take probably several conversations, yep. you being well read on it, you knowing how to talk about things, yep. um, and, and trying to get them out of that worldview. If they're flirting with it, you might be able to kind of talk about certain things with them and try to get them out of that before they slip into maybe serious relativists. Right. So, again, we think this is kind of going out of fashion. You might still encounter, yep. especially in the older generations, um, moral relativists are going to be more common. Right. Um, I don't think you're going to see a lot of like, I'm a philosophy major and I'm a moral rel- relativist. Right. I, I don't think you're going to see that as much. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a few things that you can try. Like, uh, We're not going to say like you'll never succeed. Mm-hmm. It's pretty rare that you're going to see them <laughs> change their mind in that moment. I've seen it happen mm-hmm. twice, I think. Yeah. 
out of 1500 conversations or whatever it is like it's mm-hmm. pretty rare but it's like, it's like there's a few things like try a few things but if it's not working kind of graciously exit and so mm-hmm. do we want to talk about those kind of two different strategies real quick like kind of like summarize them yeah we can totally summarize that so one thing that i've tried a lot and I, i'm not the only one i know a lot of people have tried this is where mm-hmm. you're trying to kind of you know get to their content mm-hmm. right and so like maybe their content is not being activated by abortion Mm -hmm. Especially maybe if they don't really get what abortion is. Um, But maybe they get something more obvious. So this is like like, uh, you hear Christian apologists all the time talking like use this phrase like what about torturing toddlers for fun? Mm -hmm. Like like almost to the point like it feels like a cliche now if you're Mm -hmm. into apologetics. But like there's a reason like that's picked. It's like it's so, so obvious Mm -hmm. that doing that for fun would be wrong. And so like asking about cases, we'll link to an article. I wrote an article a long time ago about like the kind of detailing, like I told this dialogue story that I had with these two relativists. I'm not going to tell on the podcast right now or it take too long. But like if, mm-hmm. if you want it like an, an example where I did that and I also kind of turned these two people kind of worked them against each other a little bit because it's like boyfriend and girlfriend and one mm-hmm. of them was like a hardcore relativist and one of them wasn't. And so like, I was able to kind of use that. If you want to see how I did that, um, we'll link to that article. But then there's also other people, um, and and we've got, I think we've got an article about this that we can link to where, like, what's going on? Yeah, we definitely do. Um, where what's going on for them is they have kind of worked out that there's not a good reason in their view to believe in objective moral truth if they don't believe in God. Yeah, so, like, just the sneak peek is we think that Moral relativism is oftentimes a natural consequence of atheism, especially if you grew up in a Christian home. If you grew up in a Christian home that didn't really go into apologetics, didn't have good answers, maybe your church didn't have good answers to a lot of your questions about, like, why do we know this? Why do we believe this? And if you were one of those Christian homes or, you know, church communities that said something like, well, just have faith. Right. That is very dangerous situation that yep. can lead to people later in life leaving the church yeah. um, and end up and up more relativist. We think that that oftentimes will come or from, utilitarian or utilitarian, um, and we think that times that oftentimes will come from atheism first. Yeah. And there's a lot of reasons for that, which we won't get into right now, maybe right. later. But um, so we've got yeah. a good article that we'll link to that kind of explains mm-hmm. like here, here here's a way that that you might be able to have the dialogue if if you realize like that's what's going on for them because mm-hmm. they basically like you can actually ask about it um, and if they say yeah I think that's what's going on for me like here's a kind of a different approach that you could take with them so we'll link to kind of both these different approaches because mm-hmm. there, there are tools for your toolbox you're going to talk to lots of different people for some people the first thing might work. For some people, the second thing might work. For a lot of people, neither of them will end up working, but at least you've tried before you graciously end the conversation. Yeah, so hopefully you feel a bit more prepared for when they do bite the bullet, if yeah. that happens, yep. um, how, to, how to handle that. I would say focus on having the end of the conversation be a place where they have a pebble in their shoe, yep. they have something to you know wrestle with. We don't want to just be like, oh, okay, you think killing babies is okay, all right. Don't act Whoops. totally chill. Yeah, like it's totally chill. <laughs> you know, oh, rape's okay sometimes. Okay, well, have a nice day. It's really nice to talk to you. Don't end like that. <laughs> right. No, 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 no. Goodbye. No, no. No, and no, don't no. do the things like, well, mm-hmm. how do I know that you're not going to try to hurt me? Like, don't do that either. They're <laughs> right. not. It's yeah. going to be fine. Right. So I would just say really focus on find clarity. Okay, we disagree on abortion right. because we disagree about this bigger thing. Right. You have the worldview of utilitarianism. I think that's a very bad worldview. I think that's a really bad argument. Right. You know, we should talk about that more sometime. Or, you know, I, I think that we're not going to get any further on abortion. Thank you so much for talking with me. Right. Just, you know, you, you have this extremist view. You have to accept this thing to accept this thing. Whatever you need to do to point out the clarity, right. have them walk away. Hopefully they're more uncomfortable about whatever that is. Because you've shown a flashlight on it in this conversation. And start by giving them that out because Mm -hmm. you might be able to rescue the conversation (laughs) this way. Like it's going to be hard to rescue it if they really dig in their heels. Mm -hmm. But if you can get them turned around and be like, do over, freebie. You can keep it on track. You can get it back on track to the things like actually pro-life and pro-choice people ought to be talking about. We ought to be talking Mm -hmm. about does the unborn matter? Do Are are they persons or pro-lifers wrong about that? Or do bodily rights trump? The right to life. Our purchase people write about that. Like these are the things that we I want us to be spending our time talking about because they're like the fundamental disagreements. I don't want to spend an hour 
debating <laughs> whether or not torturing toddlers for fun is okay or whatever. So, like, you try to rescue, try to give them that out, but if it doesn't work, if they dig their heels in, then we've given you a bunch of tips for how to deal with that, and hopefully they help you have better dialogues. Thank you for listening to the Equipped for Life podcast, a project of Equal Rights Institute. Equal Rights Institute uses speaking, writing, YouTube videos, podcasts, online courses, and campus outreach to help pro-life advocates in the areas of practical dialogue tips, relational apologetics, pro-life philosophy, and sidewalk counseling. If you've been helped by this podcast, please consider supporting it by making a donation at EqualRightsInstitute.com.